The oldest life of St. Brigid was by Cugitosis, a 7th century Irish monk. He refers to being commissioned to do this work, uh, drawing upon an extensive tradition that had been passed down. Uh, the fact that he was a monk, someone who's dedicated his life to the church, and not only that, was recognised by his contemporaries, as being the person most qualified for this uh, very, very important task of writing about a saint, indicates to the Christian reader of this that we are reading something by a trustworthy author. He writes about St. Bridget's Church that it was the head of virtually all the Irish churches and occupies the first place, excelling all the monasteries of the Irish. So this is, from our perspective, a trustworthy author writing about at least one of the most important Irish saints ever. The trustworthiness of this text and the other hagiographies of St. Bridget is compounded by the fact that there's no trace of any controversy. Ireland at this time had many people capable of reading and writing, but we can't find any text that casts any doubt upon these writers about St. Bridget. Um, now, can we find any controversies in the 7th century? Absolutely, there is a huge controversy over the uh, Synod of Whitby, the Roman dating of Easter and the Roman tonsure that was accepted in that synod. So when something controversial happens in Ireland in the 7th century, there's a massive uh, amount of material on that controversy. For anyone who has a sound knowledge of 7th century Ireland, it's impossible to imagine that if something so heterodox as what the feminists and pagans are claiming, the invention and popular veneration of a, of a fake saint or a, or a heavily distorted saint happened, that there would not be at least some scrap of evidence to suggest that there was some kind of controversy over this. It's impossible to believe that. Both the feminists and pagans are claiming that these monastic authors were great deceivers. Basically, they use a more modern terminology like uh, psychological warfare agents who constructed a false worldview to, to push forward their political intentions. This is the sort of narrative that they, they have about this period. The obvious question for the feminists, which they cannot answer, is that if St. Bridget was, as they say, some sort of proto-feminist, why would the church decide to canonize her and venerate her? As for the pagans, if St. Bridget was actually based on a goddess, why would the church do this? If they want to convert pagans to Christianity, how does this really help them to achieve this? Anyone who would convert to Christianity because they found that their goddess had been turned into a saint would not really make for much of a, of a Christian convert. Their views, therefore, are not coherent, but there's something even worse for them. Their versions of St. Bridget, which is proto-feminist Bridget and uh, goddess Bridget, 
are still fundamentally based on the writings of these monastic authors. Now, if they believe them to be these great deceivers, how do they know when there's a piece of writing that is accurate, when a piece of writing has been distorted, and when a piece of writing has been totally invented? Because what they do in effect is when they see a passage from the life of St. Bridget, whether by Cogitosis or one of the later ones, and they feel they can apply a feminist or pagan interpretation to that passage, then they don't question the authenticity of that passage. That is when the writer was writing a true thing. Then, when there's a passage that doesn't really work for them, but in some, if they changed it in a few details, it could work for them, that's when they say that the monk writer uh, took a pagan or feminist story and changed it a little bit. And then, in the sections that are so clearly Christian, that there's no way they could apply any kind of other interpretation onto it, then they say these are the passages that have been totally fabricated. What is the criteria for doing this? There is no criteria other than basically what is convenient for their theory. We, on the other hand, can accept the entire text, applying a Christian interpretation to something that was written by Christians, and also for Christians, about a Christian saint. They accuse these Christian writers of taking pagan building blocks to construct the Irish Christian religion, but funny, funnily enough this is exactly what the neo-pagan is doing. They want to in some way believe and practice what the pre-Christian Irish pagans uh, believed and practiced, but they don't know enough about this religion, because the people of that time all converted to Christianity. So they have to take these type of things, like the writings about a Christian saint, and take those building blocks to construct their neo-pagan religion. So the very thing that they're accusing the, the early Irish Christians of doing is the thing that, in fact, the neo-pagans are doing. The feminists argue that St. Bridget was opposed to the hierarchical and patriarchical church organization, whereas we see here that when she was making the foundation of her church, she did this with a high priest who was of course a man. In this section we see St. Bridget takes the veil, which means that she became a nun, formally and in accordance with the church tradition. In this section, St. Bridget blesses the womb of a young woman who had become pregnant after committing fornication. Predictably, this is used by feminists as a sort of, uh, they're using it in a way like a legal precedent for abortion. However, I would point out simply that St. Bridget does not perform a medical operation in any way similar to the modern abortion practices. Rather, she blesses the womb. Also, this passage, uh, the use of this passage by feminists leads to a major contradiction because it says at the end, she faithfully returned the woman to health and to penance. So this passage that they try to use is also a condemnation of fornication, which is not a part of their position. Similar incidents appear in the lives of two other Irish saints, Saint Kieran and Saint Aid, in which in both stories a woman committed fornication, became pregnant, the saint blessed the womb, and the pregnancy ended. The fact that such an event occurs in the lives of multiple Irish saints without one word of controversy shows to me that 
this was not something that was perceived in any way like the modern abortion practices. And what's happening here is the feminists are reading these texts through a strong bias of their belief system and applying something that has only really started to come about in 20th and 21st centuries. A hot topic in these uh, contemporary times uh, that, that just simply does not apply to the 5th, 6th, 7th century uh, at all. The bottom line is this, they repented for fornication, they went to a holy person to be blessed, and then they accepted the will of God in the matter, and this is certainly not the feminist position. We are going through the text chronologically here, and that's why sometimes we're going to a passage that refutes the pagan position, and then one that refutes the feminist position. Uh, so in this section, uh, we see a miracle in which a group that are described as as a vain and diabolical cult are prevented from fulfilling their intention. And what was this intention? When we read the text, it appears to be that they were planning a ritualistic occult murder and uh, now neo-pagans might try to deny that that's part of their belief system uh, you would hope so from a modern group but this has been something uh, in pagan history this tells us about St. Bridget's miracle working relics which again from the orthodox christian perspective is going to be for us a large confirmation that she was indeed a saint you can pause here if you'd like to read it all the heading alone tells you all you need to know about what this says for the pagan perspective here we see where saint bridget was buried which was in this her church, this very, very important church next to a bishop. And one point to take from that is that this cult around St. Bridget was something that was recognised by the Irish church's uh, authority figures like bishops. That um, it wasn't some kind of uh, heterodox schismatic group that was doing this, which is absolutely what we would uh, expect to find if there were pagans who had made a kind of uh, only superficial conversion to Christianity and wanted to maintain the worship of a goddess in this way. This would not ha have the recognition of bishops or be something that was happening in, in a central and important church. Another point from here, uh, we can see that there were hanging crowns, which, um, to look into that more detail, I would refer people back to one of my previous videos. It's a small point in a way, but it shows that the Irish church in general was a part of the larger church body, east and west, not only in theology, but even down to these particular details of church decoration. This is where the pagans would feel they have their strongest argument. They claim that uh, there was a goddess called Bridget, and therefore it follows that it must be that everything that's said about St. Bridget is, is from this uh, goddess. Now, what do they know about this goddess? Basically nothing. There's an extremely small section um, from a document known as Cormac's Glossary that refers to a goddess being known by the name Bridget, a pre-Christian Irish goddess. Um, this seems like it could be a strong point for them, but one of the big problems is that this goddess was associated with poetry 
whereas St. Bridget is not associated with poetry at all. So their main premise, that the things that were about this goddess were adapted and, and turned into a Christian saint, but this was a goddess of poetry. So we're going to expect to see that the uh, invented narrative would have some big poetic basis to it. That she, for example, St. Bridget, was St. Bridget a poet? No, she wasn't. So if you are going to make a goddess of poetry into a saint, you'd think that maybe she would have uh, written a poem, but no. Um, that is very bad for them. But it gets worse because Cormac's glossary, you know, they, they're going to jump on a piece of evidence like this uh, and walk away with it celebrating without maybe reflecting on who is the author of Cormac's glossary. Saint Cormac of Cashel. He was a bishop and he was canonized as a saint. So again, he is in continuity with this church tradition. He he did not make this link. He didn't say, oh, there was this goddess in the past, and, the, and then this... He didn't say this about St. Bridget. He recognized St. Bridget as a Christian saint. He was part of the same church as her, and got canonized just like her. So this would be one of their strongest points, but in fact, it... Uh, explodes on them whenever it's uh, analysed uh, at all, really. Then, going into the etymology of the word Bridget, sometimes the can say, in fact, she was a fire goddess, and that's why they would use this type of section. Of course, it doesn't really need much dwelling on. We know from the Christian perspective that the Holy Spirit is sometimes symbolized or even perceived as fire, for example, during Pentecost, and this is the explanation for these passages in the life of St. Bridget and the life of many, many other saints as well. This section demonstrates the immense honor that St. Bridget had, and also the extent to which it was unanimous and authoritative. And this section is another example of the conversion of a druid to Christianity. This section would be used by feminists to try to try to say that uh, what's being expressed here is um, an opposition to male authority figures, in this case being her father, and also a local king. Now that is true. But only in this specific context where who whose authority is she not respecting here? Her father before his conversion, so a pagan, and also the local king who's also a pagan. And what is she doing? Is she disrespecting them? Is that the, the point of this story? No, the point of this story is her great generosity. That is the, the main point. And for who is she doing this? For uh, women's rights? No, it says specifically for Christ. This is a very important passage because it's used by feminists to try to justify uh, a precedent for female ordination to the position of bishop. But let's read the text a little more closely. They tend to just assert that uh, Br Bridget was a bishop and uh, this appears in the text and they move on and, and don't really go through this passage uh, word for word. So we read, The bishop, being intoxicated with the grace of God, there did not recognize what he was reciting from his book for he consecrated Bridget with the orders of a bishop. This virgin alone in Ireland, said Mel, will hold the Episcop Episcopal ordination. While she is being consecrated, a fiery column ascended from her head. So the very important things to highlight here is, first of all, 
this wasn't the intention of Mel. Furthermore, we know who this Mel was. He he later was canonized as a saint, Saint Mel of Arda. So again, that's important to consider because Mel is not a heterodox figure to um, inaugurate this new tradition of of making a female bishop. And furthermore, it says that um, in in the early part of the text there that he did not recognize what he was reciting. So this wasn't uh, done intentionally, um, but rather was an accident. It mentions also with the grace of God, and what I think the meaning of this event is, is that Bridget was a bishop in a sort of symbolic sense in regards to the authority that she held uh, in the communities that she was in. Um, the other thing that's important to see there is it's certainly not evidence for this being a precedent because Mel says this virgin alone in Ireland alone, so no one else so this isn't the precedent this was the text is saying a mistake that happened and it will never happen again so a terrible argument to try to use this uh, passage to justify female ordination to the position of bishop today. Um, however, all that said, there's proof later on that's even stronger for showing um, that not only is this not evidence for female ordination to bishop today, but even more than this, that St. Bridget did not act as or was viewed as by her contemporaries or herself as being a, a bishop in practice. So actually we see only a short time later uh, this that says on the following day, Monday, Mel came to Bridget to preach and say mass for her between the two Easters. Now anyone who knows the, the functions of a bishop knows that a bishop can say the mass. So Bridget couldn't say the Mass for herself, it has to be led by a priest or a bishop. And I'm going to continue to go through the text chronologically, but actually the last slide that I'm going to show from this text is going to be the strongest proof that Bridget did not uh, act as or consider herself, and nobody considered her to be a uh, a bishop in effect in her lifetime or after until the uh, modern feminist arguments. In this section St. Mel uh, informs St. Bridget that St. Patrick is coming to an area near them and she says that she intends to go to see him, uh, to speak with him and also to get a blessing from him. This is important to mention because in regards to the feminist idea that St. Bridget was in some way opposed to the hierarchical and patriarchal authority of the church, well, St. Patrick was at the head of all of this, and so supposedly she should be opposed to him, but she's not opposed to him, on the contrary, she has great respect for him. You can pause if you would like to read all of this, um, but it's a very powerful argument against the two groups simultaneously because it's a story about a pagan man who is converted to Christianity by St. Bridget. However, this is the key point that she cannot uh, baptize him, and therefore St. Patrick gives her the advice to have someone with her who has the ability to baptize a priest with her at all times for example uh, by being the person who rides her chariot refer this back to what was previously said the argument or idea that St. Bridget was really a bishop uh, totally refuted here because this is the same text this is later than ever, all of the slides here have been chronological. 
So this is later, and you see that she does, can't say mass and she can't baptize. So although Saint Mel accidentally said this, she was no one considered that she was actually a bishop in practice, and the same te text makes that abundantly clear. I would also point out that it makes it abundantly clear without really overstating it. These things are happen later than the ordination, and that gives me the impression that nobody conceived of it this way, and so it didn't need to be spelled out, really. It's just other incidents that happen later in the text that you can notice these things. So the fact that it's not overstated also shows that it was just something that would never have been considered seriously in the 5th, 6th, 7th century in Ireland. The idea that a, a woman could be uh, formally in a, in a way that was accepted by the larger body of the church to be formally ordained as a bishop, no one would have imagined this or, or presented this argument or used this story from the life of St. Bridget in this way. And, and so the fact that there is clear proof there, but it's not overstated, really um, emphasizes, I think, how, how weak the argument is. Other arguments include this, um, which is, in fact, I think... Uh, one of the more some of these things can can just be people's lack of understanding misinterpretation but this one i think was really i don't know who originated this argument but i do think that they were a very deceptive person really and, and I, I would accuse them um of being badly intentioned in making this claim because the truth is nobody knows when that festival was the earliest mention of it is from a text that i mentioned earlier in this video cormac's glossary that says that it was the time that the sheep's milk would come that's the the closest there there is to anything specific on on when this pagan festival was so what they've done is they've said, okay, um, St. Bridget's Day is on February 1st, so I suppose that must mean that the that must have been when the pagan festival was. They've already assumed their uh, the, they've already assumed the idea that St. Bridget was uh, a fake story. They've already assumed that, and so they've said, okay, well. If her special day was 1st of February, we know that this pagan festival was around springtime, so that must have been the date of the pagan festival. There's no, um, there's no source that they have to say when that festival was. So th this thing, which again, you will see this asserted uh, as if it's something unquestionable. Uh, on, the, on the contrary, it's completely baseless and some people will just be repeating it without knowing that it's baseless but I think whoever started this was was really uh, it amounts to a lie really um, to know that there's no evidence for when the pagan festival was but to to link it to St. Bridget's Day in this way um, I think that's quite malicious really. Another argument uh, that's used is that St. Bridget's cross is a pagan symbol. What this pagan symbol was or meant or any evidence for this of course they don't have. Um, we have a story the, from the Christian side um, which comes in a later life of St. Bridget that said that she wove a cross out of reeds um, on the deathbed of a pagan and explain to him the, the meaning of the cross uh, in the Christian context and uh, converted him and he was baptized. Um, that's our story, what's their story? They, they don't really have one. Again, it's just an assertion. This was a pagan symbol uh, and they, they, they'll move on. It's worth pointing out as well that 
it it doesn't even follow that if it was a pagan symbol, what would that prove? Um, because with the story that I've just told, she could have been showing this pagan that this symbol that you have uh, venerated and worshipped and so on, it actually has its fulfilment in the crucifixion. So, you know, first of all, I don't really think it was a pagan symbol. I don't think there's any proof for that. Um, but even if it was, it doesn't really prove the pagan position at all. In fact, following through, you know, as St. Bridget said to the pagan, I would say the same thing. If this was one of your symbols, it's been completely fulfilled and superseded by the symbol of the cross in the context of the crucifixion of Christ. So, um, again, not a very strong argument whenever it's uh, looked into. Beyond this uh, is what normally amounts only to an appeal to the authority of university professors that back their position. Um, that's something that could be maybe looked at in a, in a different video, a greater length. Um, why appeal to authority is a logical fallacy, and also why the university system is not uh, unbiased. Um, that, in fact, it generally universities um, have an, an anti-Christian uh, focus, even, and, and certainly individual professors. So. Um, this is also worth mentioning that a lot of the time uh, there will be things that are supported only on the basis that an, an expert has uh, said this and um, it doesn't require really evidence to back it up because the, the argument is the appeal to the authority of that university professor. It's worth pointing out that it, the pagan arguments are not always made by pagans, uh, but also atheists as well, because um, it also fits in with their perspective of religion being false uh, to present the line of argument that says that um, they are sort of constructed by men and don't come from divine revelation. I would like to say something about um, how sad it is, really, uh, the tragedy of the fact that these people have arrived at these conclusions, because, um, beginning with the feminists, this woman would be one of the greatest examples to be inspired by. Um, you know, with feminism in some way, it is trying to say something good about women, or what a woman can be, and this is someone that they could really look up to and admire, and unfortunately instead they they try and twist the narrative of who she was, and um, deny her really. For the pagans in some ways I feel it's even worse, because the impulse for what sort of forms that or attracts people to this sort of uh, ideology? Um, I'm talking here specifically about Irish neo pagans. Is a desire to be traditional uh, in their mind, going back to a pre-Christian tradition, so the most ancient uh, possible tradition uh, is their logic of what they're supposedly getting in contact with. And the other thing is they feel that it brings them closer in contact in contact to the to the country, you know, so there's a sort of patriotic uh element to it, which is so incredibly uh tragic because um nothing could be more untraditional and nothing could be more uh un Irish as as it turns out. Um this pagan idea, like the idea that um, Irish people never were really Christians. The origin of this, uh, even in the specific case of what the things discussed uh, in this video about St. Bridget, come from the late 1800s and the early 1900s. 
uh, normally by French or English writers, but then later Irish writers, but based in Trinity College in Dublin, which has often held effectively an anti-Irish uh, sentiment, it has a culture of that. And the, the, the whole idea of... Uh, St. Bridget actually being some goddess comes from people who were trying to uh, denigrate the Irish people. Like, these people were never really Christian people. Um, so how, how tragic to then actually adopt that, supposedly in the name of, of some sort of incredibly misguided um, patriotism, actually adopting a, a sort of national identity that was actually a caricature of people who um, considered Irish people to be to be lesser people. And uh, also in regards to the, that's the patriotic element, the traditional element, um, of course, I explained that logic uh, the before Christianity there was paganism but it's not traditional because they're constructing this is the whole the, the term neo-pagan because they don't really know very much about what these practices were so they have to construct it often taking things from Christian writers to to try and make this actually new religion because again if they wanted to be faithful to the pagans of the past, they would convert to Christianity because that's what those pagans did. Hence, Ireland became a, a Christian country. And then we actually have um, fairly ancient documents from the 7th century, Irish writers. Uh, so, you know, there's a massive body, this uh, church tradition, body of texts, that they, they reject that. Irish writers from the seventh century, in favour of anti-Irish writers from the from the twentieth. Um, so there, there's a sort of uh, tragedy, really, to them that this sort of field project. Then it could be asked: Is Saint Bridget, in uh, the terms that we use today, Roman Catholic or Orthodox? This would come into a much larger debate about the first millennium of the church, um, and therefore I would pass that on to uh, uh, the work of someone else who's on YouTube and has an excellent blog as well called Ubi Petrus, and uh, I'll put links to that discussion. St. Bridget coming from the 5th and 6th century, of course, the Orthodox position is that for the first millennium, there was one church, and that one church today is what's called the Orthodox Church. And so that is the key in regards to St. Bridget. If the whole church is what today is called, the whole church in the first millennium is what today is called the Orthodox Church, then of course she was Orthodox. And so I think to get into that, better to pass that on to someone who has uh, dedicated a lot of research to that and also participated in debates on this issue. Similarly, to be well versed on this, uh, taking it into a sort of broader context, debates between Orthodox and Pagans and also Orthodox and Atheists are going to be useful, I think, to understanding this, and so I'll link a few of those in the description as well. There is a dark undercurrent to this topic, um, especially in its more recent manifestations. Some sort of celebrations and, and festivals have taken place in, in Ireland recently, um, where they're doing something very interesting, which is not actually arguing their one position, but actually saying this is some this figure is something that we can all celebrate. So whether you're a totally secular uh, feminist, whether you are a neo pagan, or whether you're a Christian, we can all celebrate and enjoy this uh, this you know 
Saint Bridget, Goddess Bridget, Feminist Bridget, whatever you want her to be, you can come and join in this um, this party. And for for the Orthodox, um, we have as part of the church tradition things that saints have prophesied about the Antichrist, because the Antichrist is going to attract followers from all different types of backgrounds not by arguing for one position but the saints prophesied that he would do have this kind of effect or or manage to somehow explain himself as a fulfillment of all of these different groups so that they could even with all the differences uh, come together and worship him basically so to many Christians he will convince them that he is uh, Christ that he's Jesus coming back for the Muslims he will convince them that he's Imam Mahdi for the pagans all different kinds of uh, pagan ideas of some sort of saviour even for the secular atheist type people he'll be able to satisfy perhaps their political agendas uh you know he, he convince the big right wingers that he's the perfect dictator and the, convince the left wing that he's the the perfect communist leader and in this way even though these things are all seemingly in conflict he will sort of neutralize all those differences uniting everyone in the in the worship of him i hope i've explained that in a way that is uh fair to how the saints have uh predicted the antichrist will be and so this is something that occurred to me when it whenever i saw what's happening here around the saint bridget celebrations of taking this saint so someone who belongs totally and completely to the uh, Christian tradition, and not just arguing that she doesn't, but now that that that's nearly that's old news. Arguing that she was uh, simply a pagan or simply a feminist. Now this new thing is coming out, which is that we it it doesn't matter in some ways, and it's something that we can we can all celebrate her uh, at the same time. And that really reminded me of these predictions of how the Antichrist will be or how he will uh, explain himself or, or justify himself to people to get people to follow him. And so it makes me uh, see, see, see some links there. It's like um, the spirit of the Antichrist, the general sort of feeling or, or type of ideology uh, is being manifested in, in these kind of celebrations and I would uh, warn absolutely people uh, first of all to become orthodox if they're not and stay away from this type of thing and uh, not don't allow orthodoxy to participate in this type of uh, anti-christ-esque celebrations this video has been um somewhat different in tone and content to previous videos and going on as well generally in future videos even future videos on saint bridget uh, it's going to be more of a positive presentation of the orthodox position rather than a negative critique of other positions i just felt uh inspired to do this when I, whenever i saw there's so much about this uh online and really a coherent defense from a christian position very rare, very rare to find that and from the orthodox position um not at all not that i could find anyway um and so i felt like there was a space to make a video like this but going on things will generally be more positive <laughs>